And we very fortunately have a lovely keynoter at the end. Has anyone ever heard of Aaron Patterson? Oh, yeah. This tender love guy has been around for a minute. In fact, was the very first person to be a core team member of both Ruby and Rails. Now there are more, but that was 2011 that you became a core member of Rails back then. I met Aaron not shortly after that, I think, when I first got into software because of Kobe. Kobe Ranquist, who founded Confreaks, which is the company that's filming this conference and films many such conferences, and you should also hire. And Kobe met Aaron. He told me yesterday, and I'd never heard this story, because they posted a contest online to solve a, uh, a zip code problem. They needed to know like the shortest distance between all of the zip codes, and they wanted it to be uh, an efficient problem or an efficient solution. And Aaron won a gift card, maybe it was $20 or so, on a website. And that's how he met Kobe and began his illustrious career in software. So please look up Tender Love online and learn more about him, but I'm just going to hand the mic to Aaron now. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Hello, everybody. Before we get started, I gotta do a, I gotta do a selfie with the audience. So please, like, one second, please bear with me. Okay. Oh, let's turn this around here. Okay. All right. There. Please wave, 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 wave everybody. Wait, you're waving to the internet. So, all right. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Okay. Um, I guess let's start. It is this. This is the final keynote. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see if you all let's see if you all remember this one. Uh, one. <laughs> Five. <laughs> oh boy. Okay. Okay. I see some of you. I, I know where some of you were yesterday morning. Um, let's see. Uh, when I was flying here, I, I live in Seattle. And while I was flying here on the airplane to Atlanta, I was reading. I was reading an article about how. Um, like being bored is very good for you. Like in this day and age of social media and stuff, be, being bored is very good because it, it increases your creativity. And that made me really, really nervous because now I'm afraid that I'm going to be increasing all of your creativity <laughs> <laughs> for, for the next hour. Um, so I want, today, today I'm gonna to talk about uh, modern dev environments. Uh, I wasn't sure what to talk, what, what to title this presentation, which is why in the in the thing it just says keynote. I, okay, actually the, the real reason is I am very bad at responding to emails and did not respond in time. <laughs> but I, I'm 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 also not sure what to call this talk. I want to talk about uh, modern day dev environments and programming efficiency in in 2023. I guess uh, I want to talk a little bit about artificial intelligence, including things like uh, since since it's very hip right now. Uh, Chat GPT and GitHub Copilot, and also touch a little bit a bit a little bit on editors, including like uh, VS Code and language servers as well. Actually, while I have all of you in the room, uh, how many of you use VS Code? Raise of hands, please. Oh my goodness, uh, Vim, the good editor. Yeah, all right, okay. <laughs> Emacs. Any, oh, we got a uh, got a few. Pico. <laughs> BB edit, Pico, Pico, anyone? No, all right, yeah, one person, great. <laughs> all right, uh, and I, I'm also gonna talk about what, what all this stuff has to do, like what this has to do with Rails since we are at a, we're at a Rails conference, so I figure I should probably talk about Rails too. And don't worry, there will be, we will have technical content. Um, I personally love technical content, so we're going, we are definitely going to have some, have some of that. Uh, hi, I am Aaron. Um, I noticed a lot of people are new here, so I'm going to say a few things about myself before we get we get into this in earnest. Uh, you can find me on social medias. I am on I am on Twitter as Tenderlove. I'm also on Mastodon as Tenderlove. That is my Mastodon one at the bottom there. It's very important that all of you send your your critical feedback to me on Twitter <laughs> because I won't see that. <laughs> We send all of your praise and adulation to my Mastodon account. <laughs> I really appreciate that. 
Uh, I, work, I work for a mom and pop e-commerce website called Shopify. <laughs> actually, that's not true. We're, we're actually a pretty big Rails shop, if I. <laughs> Um, I'm on the Ruby. I'm on the Ruby core team and the Rails core team, and I've been on both of these teams for about about 10 years now. Uh, and I was in uh, Eileen's keynote on the first day, and in Eileen's keynote, uh, she was talking about why she remains on the Rails core team. She said, "I remain on the Rails core team for all of you in order to make uh, Rails better. Rails better for the community." And I'm really proud of her for saying that. It made me feel very good. But I am not like I am not that good of a person. Um, I'm actually on the Rails core team for the power and the, <laughs> the glory and, and the hope that one day my Rails daddy will finally say, I'm proud of you, son. <laughs> uh, I'm excited to read the blog post about that joke. Um, <laughs> so how is, how is your Rails conf been going? Great, that's awesome. Um, I've, been, I've really been enjoying the conference as well. One of my favorite talks was Andy, Andy Kroll's presentation about doing rewrites. Uh, it was a really great presentation, and he mentioned during his talk that he would, he would much rather buy than build. Like he, He's a fan of buying rather than building because uh, it's cheaper to pay for a finished thing to try it than to try and reinvent the wheel. And this actually reminded me a little bit about myself, and I want to share that with you. Uh, it reminded me that, of the fact that I am actually a bona fide mycologist. And I will get in, what this means is that I like to hunt for mushrooms. I joined the local mushroom club. In, in uh, Seattle, we have the Pacific Northwest, the PSMS Pacific something something. Anyway, I joined the mushroom club. And I want to share, want to share this with you. These are some of the mushrooms I picked. These are some chanterelles that I picked. Really great, go out hunting for mushrooms. These are, these are, this is called a shaggy mane. Uh, it's a really great, really great mushroom, very delicious, but you'll never see them in stores because they, they only last about 24 hours. So after they grow up, uh, after about 24 hours, they melt and turn into ink and you can't, you can't really eat them. Uh, so you'll never see these in stores. Uh, and it, also an interesting fact about these mushrooms is they contain a chemical that if you, if you eat the mushroom, you can't drink alcohol after that because it'll, it'll make you very sick, which is interesting. But they're delicious. You should eat, try them. This is one of my favorite. It's called a fairy ring mushroom. I, I was going to apologize for being a nerd, but I've, <laughs> I'm at a programming conference. <laughs> So I won't do that. Um, it's, there are many mushrooms are called fairy ring mushrooms. The Latin name for this one is Merasmius oreades. This is what it looks like when it's growing. It actually grows best in people's yards. So I walk around the city of Seattle in springtime <laughs> picking these out of people's yards. <laughs> And I look like a weirdo doing it. But when you join, when you join the Mycological Society, they give you this little, they give you this little card uh, that says, you know, I am a bona fide mycologist. <laughs> so, so what I do, what I do is like, I'm picking up. I, so this actually happened. Someone came out to me and was like, "What are you doing?" In my, in my yard, I'm like, oh, I'm just picking these mushrooms. <laughs> they're like, I'm like, I'm, you see, I am a bona fide mycologist. I give them the card, and and they're like, I'm like, we're, I, you know, I'm studying these. They're very, very important. Like, I'm, I'm part of the mycology society. You know, if you ever see these in your yard again, like, here's my number. Give me a call. I'll take care of them for you. <laughs> But I, I got into this, like, I got into this hobby because of a friend. Um, her family, uh, she lived in Portland. Her family would pick matsutake mushrooms in, in that region. And I'd never had any wild mushrooms before, and they gave me a bag of them, and I smelled them. They smelled amazing, just so delicious. Uh, I made, took them home, made a risotto out of them, and they were just, it was the best thing ever. And I really wanted more of them. So I went to the grocery store. The grocery store was charging, like, 50 bucks a pound for these things. I couldn't believe it, like 50 bucks a pound. But they were going out in the forest and getting them for, for free. It was amazing. So I was like, well, I, I'm, I'm not paying 50 bucks a pound for this. This is ridiculous. So instead, I spent weeks studying how to identify mushrooms. Uh, I drove hundreds of miles into the forest, did camping, spent days, you know, spent days 
hunt, hiking around, hunting for mushrooms, only to find about a pound of them, but I saved 50 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> and the moral of the story, what Andy's talk really taught, to, taught me is that uh, I, I don't value my time. <laughs> so I want to share, <laughs> and uh, it's maybe kind of sad because I was, I was thinking about myself and kind of examining my other hobbies, which are like cheese making. I love making cheese and just buy that. Love sausage making. And, and I think the pinnacle, the pinnacle of of uh, demonstrating that I don't value my time is that one of my other hobbies is that I love programming. <laughs> anyway, speaking, speaking of not valuing my time, um, I, started a, I started a YouTube channel uh, that I would hope that, I hope that all of you will come follow me on my YouTube channel. I don't have a really good schedule for it. It's pretty sporadic. Uh, I'm trying to get my subscriber base up and I thought, I think the reason I'm not doing very well is because I don't have enough clickbait thumbnails. So I've started, like, I've been practicing and I want to share a few of them with you. So like, this is not a good clickbait thumbnail. Like, this, this is a really good clickbait thumbnail. <laughs> so I want, to share, I want to share a few more of them with you that I made. I can't believe, Rails Monkey Patch, that? <laughs> this is not your active job. <laughs> I'm not saying it was active support. But it definitely was. <laughs> so making, making these clickbait thumbnails made me, made me realize that, that uh, I am old. <laughs> and to give you kind of a reference point, a reference point for this, um, when, I, when I started programming, uh, like syntax highlighting was not a thing. <laughs> like I specifically have to remember, I would recompile, I'd go to work, Syntax highlighting had just started, like just happened. I was recompiling Vim so that I could have syntax highlighting. And we were having heated debates in the office about whether or not syntax highlighting actually had any merits. Which is kind of, now when you think about it, it's kind of wild. And I'm not, I'm not here to say that I am, I am old and that to tell you everything was so much better in the, you know, in the good old days or anything like that. I, I don't actually believe that whatsoever. I think that right now is the best time to be a programmer ever. Now is the best time to do what we do. Over, over my development career, I've seen a lot of like, incremental improvements to, to uh, our, our careers or to our, to our programmer lives, I suppose, including like syntax, syntax highlighting and garbage collection, which is kind of surprising. Like at one point, at one point garbage collection was like a very controversial thing and people were arguing whether or, not, whether or not garbage collection was a good thing. Unfortunately, somehow it, it has become controversial again. Thank you, Rust. Uh, <laughs> but it's just something that we, did, like, we don't even really think about today. We take for granted. One of the biggest improvements to productivity and programmer happiness that I have ever seen is, is Rails. Uh, when I started learning Ruby and Rails, I was actually a full-time, I was a full-time Java developer. And honestly, at that time, learning Rails for me was like incredibly depressing. And the reason is because I would be doing, like I would be doing my normal day-to-day -day programming in Java. It would take me forever to do anything. And I would think about, think to myself like, man, if I was doing this in Rails, I would be done by now. And it was really depressing to think about that. However, uh, Rails, Rails came on the scene and uh, it brought a couple of things that were really, two, two really important things. Uh, first is convention over configuration. Like this was a really big deal at the time, convention versus configuration. People configured tons of stuff back then. Uh, but I think uh, something that was a little more looked over was making decisions for us. I think convention over configuration is more, more sort of a subset of this. Like Rails is making a bunch of decisions for us so that we don't have to, like, we don't think about how to connect to the database. We use Active Record. Uh, we don't think about what folders to put models or controllers or views in. The, those decisions were all made for us, and we don't have to think about those things today. And to give you a sample of like what it was like back in the 2000s, like this is literally some code. Like this was coding in the early 2000s. This was this was me writing XML Spring Java Beans. It was. It was not awesome. We, we literally had meetings about what to call like primary key column names. We had meetings about this stuff. We wrote design documents about DAOs, and back then it did not, it was, this was pre-crypto, and this actually meant data access object. And, uh, 
Now, Rails came along and, and the framework said, well, look, if you just follow the convention, everything will just work. You name your primary key ID, uh, table names are plural nouns, and the thing that you're storing, the class name is just the singular of that noun. So you just, just do that and everything will just work, and it turns out you have less code, you have fewer decisions, there are fewer distractions. You don't have to think about, make all these decisions because the decisions are made for you. You just do what, you do what the framework says and you're good to go. And even better than this, more importantly, is that you don't have to think about it. You, don't, you just don't have to think about any of these things and that is because thinking sucks. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Thinking, thinking is awesome, but you should be spending more time thinking about your, your application and not your, not your primary key names. And I, I distinctly remember working as a Java developer and at the time people were like, they did what? You name all of your, you name all of your primary keys the same thing? What? How dare you take away my freedom to, freedom to decide what folder to put this file in? So when, when Rails was released, all of these things were, they were very, very controversial at the time, but today it's just, it's a normal part of our lives. It's something we don't even think about now. And honestly, I think this is a thing that we're gonna start seeing with artificial intelligence as well. Today, it's, it's quite controversial, but I, I really think that in the future, this is gonna be a big part of our lives and a big part of our, our development practices. Now, that's not to say that these tools aren't without problems. The, the intelligence may be artificial, but the problems that they're presenting to us today are, are actually real. And some of those problems include like licensing issues. We don't necessarily know what all of these LLMs were trained on, were they trained on GPL code? Is it okay to use the code that they produce? GitHub's terms of services say that the snippets that Copilot provides are uh, ours to keep, but is that GitHub's permission to give? Uh, it's, it's not sure, I'm not sure about that, and I do see, <laughs> I was thinking about business opportunities with this. What you could do, what you could do, since I'm a, a terrible person, is you could sell insurance that you don't get sued for using Copilot snippets. <laughs> so I can imagine in the future it'll be like, okay, upgrade to Copilot Pro so you don't get sued. <laughs> but I, I also think that there are like ethical problems as well, like auto-completing, if you have an auto-complete in your editor, that's much different, like hitting tab in your editor is much different than opening up somebody else's library and being like, you know, copy-paste into your project. Right? You kind of think about that, you're like, is that, am I doing the right thing? Is that okay for me to copy and paste? But you hit tab, you're like, ah, that's fine, whatever, right? Copilot feels like you're just copying and pasting from Stack Overflow, but you don't have any context about the code, like the surrounding code. Now, I think that's kind of interesting because all of you, I'm sure all of you have used uh, Stack Overflow, I am a Stack Overflow user as well, and everybody here knows that the first answer is like not the right one. It's never, like it's never the right one. You have to like read down and be like, oh okay, it's actually, like that's the good one. This, I think this is like the difference between, this is the difference between a junior and senior engineers. Like, <laughs> <laughs> senior engineers scroll down a little bit, okay. <laughs> Unfortunately though, you don't know like, the, the answer that Copilot is giving you, you don't know how many upvotes were on that or how far down Copilot scrolled to give you that. Now, the, the other problem is that these LLMs will actually give you, like, believable bullshit. And it, it's very, very believable. So I, I have an example here, like, I am, for some reason, uh, writing an, applica an, an application controller here, and for some reason I am writing some machine code in it. Like, don't, there's no reason for this. I was just doing it, because I, I like to do this. As I said, I, I don't value my time. Uh, anyway, like, this, this autocomplete here, the, the text in gray is an autocomplete that, that Copilot gave me, and if you, know anything about, um, if you know anything about ARM assembly code, then this actually looks like a plausible autocompletion. Now, I know the library, and I know that this is wrong, so I know, I know that I'm not gonna use this autocomplete, but somebody new who doesn't know the library, they have no idea. So they're gonna hit tab and then they'll have to go like, oh, this isn't right, they run it, it doesn't work. And then they're actually gonna have to go do the thing that they didn't wanna do, which was read the documentation and figure out how to actually use it. So they wasted their time hitting that tab completion, but I can imagine like, as somebody working on implementing a tool like Copilot, they're like, well, it's, you know, it's fine because the user of this, they just wasted their own time, right? They hit tab, they hit tab, it didn't work, 
ah, no big deal. Like no harm, no foul, they, they'll, they'll figure it out eventually. Now, I want, I want to bring up another example, and I know that the text is going to be very small for this, so you don't, you don't need to read it. Uh, this is an example taken from ChatGPT. Uh, somebody took a command line tool and asked ChatGPT, how do, I, like, how do I do this with this particular command line tool? And ChatGPT responded to them with some completely believable bullshit. And the, the person believed it. They, they were convinced that ChatGPT was correct. So they filed a ticket on the upstream project to say like, hey, I asked ChatGPT how to use your library and it didn't work. And I like, I do not, so I, I tried to censor this, like don't, I don't blame the, I don't blame the OP whatsoever. It, it's completely believable what ChatGPT did, but it was wrong. And fortunately, like the, the upstream maintainer had to respond to this. The upstream maintainer had to respond and they were extremely kind. They said, you know, hi, large language models like ChatGPT don't actually know how this works. They use command line tools, like blah. But they make up, they make stuff up and that may or may not exist. And this person, the upstream maintainer was so kind and so like very understanding. Me personally, my face would be like melting I don't know how I would deal with this, like just can you not figure this out, like they can't know everything. But despite these problems, like I'm actually very optimistic about this technology. I think it's going to work out very well. I'm like, yes. <laughs> as part of my, as part of my like foray into on, like, live streaming, I subscribe to a, to a website that gives you stock video. So I'm trying to get my money's worth out of it in this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I, think that, I think that this technology is actually going to eliminate a lot of drudgery and repetitiveness in our jobs. And I want to give an example of where I think this will actually help out big time. Here's a, here's a great, great example. Again, you don't need to read this PR, but I'll tell, I'll tell you what it is. Um, all of us today were deploying applications into production, and the default thing, we always deploy our apps with SSL on, right? We're running behind SSL, always. And unfortunately, the default configuration in Rails, if you do like Rails new on a new application, the production configuration will have SSL disabled. So this seems like a mismatch between reality and our defaults. It's like, hey, we should, we should just dis turn that on. Like, it should be SSL by default. Totally makes sense. Now, unfortunately, changing this one tiny configuration issue broke tons of the tests in Rails. We have a lot of tests in rail ties that are booting the application into production mode and then making sure that we can perform requests against the app in production mode. So it broke all, it broke all of those tests. And the fix to those tests is just something like this. All we have to do is we say like, hey, when you do a request, we need you to do it, we need you to do it with SSL enabled. Because otherwise we're failing with a bunch of redirects in here. Now, unfortunately, this is spread throughout our test, like our test code. This is everywhere in our test code. We have to change all this stuff, and it's not like, it's too hard for a search and replace, and it's too boring for me to do. <laughs> so I'm not doing it, which is, this is like the perfect place for co-pilots. Like, hey, can you like please go fix these tests, please? Like, I don't want to do this. This is very boring. You do it, please. And what I think would actually be great about it is if it just did the dumb thing everywhere in the code. If it just said, like, literally, just put HTTPS on everywhere just did this everywhere. I would actually be, I'd be very happy about that. I, I think that would be great. Because the next thing I would do is I would go in and do the actual interesting part of my job, which is refactoring that code to something better. This is, a, this is actually a perfect part of our red-green refactor, like red-green refactor work, workflow, which I'm not being 100% true to red-green refactor. Please uh, go ahead and address me about that on Twitter. <laughs> There, it's good. Anyway, we, so we made the change to see the test go red. Making the test green is like not, not the interesting part of our job. Doing that refactoring is what's actually going to be interesting to us. So we can, we can leverage AI to do this boring task for us, and this leaves time for us to do actually the more actual interesting parts of our, our job, more interesting and creative parts. It means we can spend less time on boring tasks. And I put boring in quotes on this slide because I think that some of us may not realize some of the tasks that we do are actually boring tasks. Remember, programmers used to want to manage their own memory. Like, they thought that was interesting. Or they wanted to sit in meetings deciding, like, primary key names. 
We used to think that was interesting when, in fact, it really was not, and we shouldn't be focusing on that thing. Also, before I move on to talking about editors and stuff, I wanted to tell you that I'm working on a new, a new style of development. Um, it is called Reduce, Reuse, and Recycle, and that is because I write garbage code. <laughs> All right, so I want to I take a look at editors. I'll talk about editors and talk about VS Code, uh, though I'm not going to talk about, I'm not going to talk too much about VS Code because I'm actually a Vim user, which is pretty awkward. Um, but I do want to follow in our theme of programmer efficiency. And I think Microsoft and VS Code brought us something that I think is a huge leap forward uh, in editor technologies and programmer efficiency, and that is the language server, which I don't know how many, how many of you use LSPs? Okay, good, fair number of you. I, I hope that we'll increase that. Uh, language server, you'll also see, when you're looking up language servers, you'll also see this reference, language server protocol or LSP. Uh, a lot of people interchangeably use this. They'll say LSP when they mean language server. It's, it gives me the very like ATM machine vibes and pin number vibes, but you, <laughs> you know what I mean. Um, now these two things are completely different. A language server is a program and the language server protocol is something that an editor in a program, the language server speak. So for example, uh, Vim speaks the language server protocol with Clang D. Clang D is a language server that is running in the background and the two of them communicate. So usually you don't have to manually start this program yourself, like your editor will start it up for you and then it just sits there in the background and does its thing and the two communicate and hopefully your editing experience gets much better. Uh, a cool thing about this is your editor can communicate with multiple language servers all at the same time. So if you have like a, a C file and a Rust file and a Ruby file all open at the same time, your editor will communicate with multiple different backends to, to talk, about, talk about the code that you're editing. And the really great thing about this is that no language server knows anything about uh, anything specific to the editor and editors only need to speak this language server protocol. So they don't need to really know about each other, they just have to speak the same language and we can reuse them, which means we can have this type of architecture here where like uh, Vim, VS Code, Emacs, any type of editor that implements the language server protocol can use any, any language server that implements a protocol as well. And this kind of architecture should be very familiar to us Rails developers because it's a, exactly the same type of architecture that Rack uses. Rack just defines a protocol, and this protocol is what all of the web servers speak, and then all of the application servers speak the other side of that protocol, and that's how we can switch out web servers with Rails or uh, Rota or how, whatever, whatever web framework we're using, but we're all using Rails, right? Yes, yes, okay. <laughs> let's, get, let's get to the technical content. <laughs> I love, <laughs> this stock video is amazing, I love it. First thing I searched was like, People, people smiling, eating salads. <laughs> so good. All right, we're gonna, today I want to actually develop a language server. I, I really like to learn by doing, so that's what we're going to do today, is we're going to build a very tiny language server, and a language server that totally works and will fit completely on one slide. And I've been praising VS Code and Microsoft for coming up with the language server standard, but I have to admit that if you're developing a language server, I personally think it is much easier to do it and test it in Vim. So I'll tell you the reason, the reason this is is because if you work on a language server with VS Code, you also, not only do you have to write the language server, you also have to write a VS Code extension. So you actually have to write two things, and this drives me bonkers. They came up with this standardized protocol that you can use between any editor, and it should be, it should be editor agnostic, yet for some reason I also have to write like a VS Code extension? It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so this is why like if you go into VS Code and you're like, I'm gonna search the extension store, and you search for like ERB, there's like a thousand of them there. And I think it's because people are like, well I wanted to, I just wanted to mess with a language server, and now I gotta write this extension, and now we have a ton of them. In contrast to Vim, all you do in Vim is you say like, I'm gonna use the Vim, Vim LSP, and then you just configure it, with the, configure it with all of the different language servers that you wanna use. So for example here, I'm configuring with Clang D, we say, hey, I want you to use the Clang D language server, and I want you to open it anytime we use, anytime we're editing a C file. Now the language server we're gonna to write today is gonna to check, do, it's a very basic language server that's just gonna check syntax. So, and we're only gonna, in order to limit our, limit our scope today, we're only gonna do it on saves. So this code will highlight the fact that we have some, it's messed up. 
Like, this is not valid Ruby code and it's gonna highlight it. Uh, language servers all communicate via standard in, standard out, or TCP, it's two, two different styles. Today we're gonna use, we're gonna communicate via standard in and, and standard out. Now the, the typical order of operations is that the editor, you open your editor and there is no language server running, you just have your editor open. And then you open a file and when you open the file, the editor will say, ah, there is a language server associated with this file type, I am going to start the language server and then I'm going to start communicating with the language server. So it'll automatically, for example, if you're using Ruby LSP, it'll automatically start up Ruby LSP and then communicate with it. And if you open up another Ruby program, it doesn't actually start another instance of the LSP or the, the language server, see even I'm doing it. It doesn't start the language, another instance of the language server, it uses the same one and then just communicates with that one for both files. Now, uh, the language server protocol is very, very simple. It just looks, it looks like this, it's just two headers, uh, followed by uh, slash r slash n and then a JSON blob. And the content type here is optional. So you'll see it gives you a content length. The length indicates the length of the JSON blob. And then you go ahead and read the JSON blob. If you squint hard, this looks very, very similar to HTTP, but it's, it's not actually HTTP. There's no real request or response. You can respond to things, but you can also do things async as well. So you can just push things to the editor. There's not necessarily a request response relationship going on. Well, it's better to think about this as events encoded with JSON that happen on either side. They happen on the editor side and they happen on the language server side and they can happen at any time. Now you can respond to particular events with an ID. Each event has an ID and if you say like, oh, I want to respond to that particular event, you can put the ID in and say like, hey, I'm responding to this one. So the first thing we need to do is we need to have a class that will control the, that will read, uh, read, like, read events from the editor. And our reader will look something like this. We, we extract the header into a buffer. By the way, I put a QR code there with the finished thing. So if you want to scan that, you can get a gist that has all of the code already. It'll be on multiple slides, so don't feel like you have to rush and get it now. Um, actually, one of these QR codes will rickroll you. I'm not going to tell you which one. <laughs> So maybe scan this one, I don't know. <laughs> All right. So the first thing we need to do is we need to read out that header. And what's, what's cool about gets, I don't know if you know this, but I learned this doing this project, is you can give gets a string and it'll scan all the way up until it matches that string. So I'm saying, hey, I want you to scan everything up until a double slash r slash n, which gives us our entire header. So we get the entire header, read that into a buffer, then we extract the content length from that, we read off that amount of data, and then we just use a JSON parser to get the, get the message. That's all there is to it. So we're able to read, we're now able to read events from the editor. Next thing is we need to write, we need to be able to write events back to the editor, and we do that with standard out. So we'll just have a class, a writer class as well. We'll keep an IO with which points at standard out. We're gonna take in a hash, a Ruby hash, we're gonna add a required key to it. This is part of the protocol. We add this required key, we calculate the, calculate the byte size of the, our JSON, and then we just write our JSON back out to the, back out to the standard, standard out. And that's it. Next thing we have to do is have an event loop where we read in events, read in events from the editor, and then we write events back out, write events back out to the editor as well. So when the editor connects, it starts up the language server and then it, says, it initializes, it sends an initialize event. And I need you all to read this slide very, very carefully. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, this, so this is the event, this is an actual event from Vim saying, hey, I want, to I want you to initialize. And what this is is a blob of JSON where the editor is telling the language server about itself. It's saying, hey, I support all of these different features. So you can inspect kind of what the features are that the editor supports. So the first event is an initialize event, uh, and we don't really care, like we don't actually care what the capabilities are because this is just a toy server that we're writing, but every single message that the editor sends to us is going to have a method key on it. So in this case, the method will be initialize. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna map that method into a Ruby method and then call that Ruby method so we can have different methods as handlers. So we'll just keep a map of these, like a method, method, to, method to method map, I guess. So in this case, we're just gonna map initialize to like an on initialize method, and then the event loop, all the event loop will do is look at that, and look at that method and then dispatch to it. So down here we'll look it up and then we'll just call it. So our on initialize method, all it's gonna do is it's going to respond back to the editor and say, hey editor, uh, these are the capabilities that I support. 
So we have kind of a, we're telling the, the editor told us about itself, we are now going to tell the editor about ourselves. And in this case, we're gonna say like, hey editor, I wanna know whenever a document is open or closed, I wanna know when a document is changed, or I wanna know when a document is saved. Uh, we're not gonna use the open and close events or the change events, like I said, we're only gonna respond to save events, but this, this is an example, you, we could do something with these. The editor will send them to us, but we're just not gonna do anything with them. So, the next thing we wanna do is say, well, we're gonna get document saved events, and our document saved events will look like this. It's just a JSON blob, and it will have a method in it that says did save, so we're gonna map that method to a Ruby method that we'll call, and the JSON blob will also contain the file that was saved as well. So now we know that this particular file was saved, and we can do something with that information. So when we get those save events, we're gonna set up a default response, and I'm, I apologize for the small text, I tried to make it bigger, but it wouldn't go. Uh, we'll, we'll set up a default response that's empty, and the reason we set it empty is because if we don't tell the editor that there are no problems, the editor will keep showing the same problem. So if we send it a problem, we also have to send it no problems when the problems are fixed. So once we set our default response, we check the syntax on the file, we extract any line information from that syntax error, and then we construct an error, like construct an error JSON blob that we send back to the, we wanna send back to the editor. We send that back to the editor and then we're good, like the editor can display it. Our file for checking syntax is very, very simple. All we're gonna do is try compiling the file. And if it compiles correctly, we return nil. If it doesn't, we're only gonna rescue from syntax errors and return those. Any other errors we're just gonna ignore because we're just doing this for fun. We could probably write something more serious, but I am not. And that is, that is it. We have an entire language server and I was able to do it on one slide uh, if you rotate it 90 degrees. <laughs> So here, here's a demo of actually running it, in, running it, I'm using it inside of Vim here, so if we, Vim loads it and if we save the file, every time we save the file, it populates the error information back, to, back into Vim, so we'll add like a class here that's just broken, save the file, we get an error and we can see that, we can see this populated back into Vim, and that is it. We were able to do that, it was only about 120 lines or something like that. Now we could implement other events, like when we could do this check when the file's updated, or we could do it, we could do it when it's opened, anything else. There are many, many different things that we could do. We could implement other checks. We don't have to limit ourselves to just like syntax errors. We could do other things as well, like, I don't know, running tests, checking types, doing, doing whatever we want to inside of this language server. <laughs> I recently joined TikTok and I, I I have the everybody's so creative person <laughs> in my head all the time now, and I feel bad. <laughs> okay. uh, that, was, that was going in my head right there, sorry. So if you wanna read more about language servers, go to, this, go to this website, you can read about it there. This one is not the, not the Rickroll one. You can scan this, it'll take you to that gist, I promise you. So that was a fun demo, but what does it have to do with Rails? I said I wanted to talk about Rails, right? Uh, a lot of the tools that I was showing you here, this, this LSP or uh, also like uh, GitHub Copilot and stuff, they're doing, they're doing um, static analysis on our code. They're doing all this stuff via static analysis. And unfortunately, that's kind of a problem. Static analysis, when I say static analysis, what that means is they're just looking at the text, okay? They're looking at the text of your code to try and figure out what to do. And we all know when we, when we declare like a user model like this, all the methods that come, that are on that user model, they actually come from the database. So there's no way for these, like these static analyzers can't see into your database to know that those are the methods there. So that's kind of, like that's kind of a problem for us as Rails developers. We have a similar problem with uh, routes files where like we generate a bunch of methods here. It can't know, can't necessarily know what methods are gonna be generated when this code, when this code runs. So it can't, may not be able to autocomplete stuff. Now there are some tools for getting around this, for example, Tapioca. This tries to solve the problem by, it knows, it knows about all this metaprogrammy type stuff and this tool will generate type files from metaprogram projects. I encourage you to check it out, but I wanted to go, like, I wanted to go a little bit further than this thing does. I kept thinking to myself, like, what if Rails had a built-in, like a built-in language server? Like, Rails obviously knows about all the metaprogramming it does, like it knows that stuff, so why couldn't it tell us, like tell us in the editor? 
And I decided to try and push this concept and I built a prototype, uh, prototype called Refreshing, which is a pun name. And you will hopefully get the pun later in the presentation. But I, I'm gonna talk about, the, talk about this prototype. Uh, this prototype is a language server that's built into Rails, connects to your editor, and will show you, show you LSP, LSP information inside of your, uh, inside your editor. Uh, for example, I wanna, I wanna demo, the, demo this, this language server. Uh, it'll give you hover information for active record. So if you hover over, hover over a class, it'll show you all the columns that are associated with that, with that class. Uh, it also gives you kind of a, like a jump to definition. <laughs> I, I have taken literally hundreds of photos in front of a green screen. <laughs> <laughs> you have no idea. <laughs> it gives you, so it gives you kind of a jump to definition. So you can say when you're hovering over, you can actually click on schema, jump to the schema file, and go check out, go check out the schema for this. I am demoing this in VS Code, but it does work in Vim as well. Uh, it'll give you hover information for URL helpers. So this one is actually very near and dear to my heart because I can never remember the effing URL helpers or which way they go, which one is which. If you hover over it, it'll tell you what path that generates and it'll also tell you what controller and action that maps to as well. So I added a new one in here. It'll work for like new user things. So it'll show you the URL pattern as well there. And I, I was afraid that these, the, this display might not be good, so here I zoomed in a little bit so you can see it. Um, also, it lets you jump to definition for URL helpers as well. <laughs> I'm very proud. Hold on, I gotta do that one more time. I really like this. Yes. <laughs> you can jump to definition as well. So if you're, if you're hovering over, for example, user URL, you can say, hey, I would like to jump to the routes file where this, where this is defined. So you can jump there and see, oh, okay, it was defined on resources. Uh, another, thing, another thing I tried implementing is automatic refreshing and error highlighting. I know that I'm like, I'm, like, I'm doing a little, little bit of feature creep here. I'm showing off two features at once, air, refreshing and error, error highlighting. This is why it is called refreshing, by the way. Uh, the, the hover stuff works inside of ERB as well. If you modify your, modify your file, you'll see on the left side, I didn't actually hit refresh or anything. It just automatically refreshed the page for me. And when it did that, like we got an error, and that error information was then taken from the Rails server, bubbled back up into my editor. And it's kind of hard to see it. I'm sure it's hard to see it on the screen, but it, it underlines where the error was in the editor. And then it gives you it gives you hover information of what the exception was as well. However, I know like I know this is completely useless because we're all TDDing our views, right? Like, <laughs> none of us are editing our ERB files and hitting refresh. We don't do that because we're good TDD people. <laughs> all right, so more ideas like, I think we could also use this for like, I, I didn't implement keyword completion. We could do that for, for URL helpers. We could have completions. So we could say like, hey, I just want a new user tab and then hit it. And it could, know, it could know those things. Maybe we could have completions for where clauses on models. Maybe we could run tests, run tests on save, like have it run a test. We save the test, run the test file, please. Uh, and I think like if you're running Rails, if, you, if you're running this, if you're running a Rails server, it would be very easy for us to fork a new test process and run, run that so we could, get, we could get faster feedback, a faster feedback uh, loop. Now, uh, at Shopify, I work on the Ruby and Rails infrastructure team, and part of my team uh, is working on the Ruby LSP, and I pitched this idea to them, and they really, like, they really liked the idea, and they started working on, they started working on uh, this, this idea, but not doing like, a bad job of it, they're doing a good job. <laughs> and they're, they're calling it uh, the Ruby, Ruby LSP Rails, and you can go check it out here. Actually, part of the demo, part of my demo was actually done via their, their stuff, not the hacky code that I did. Uh, but you can go check that out there, and they have implemented it. So go give it a try, please. Um, now, I wanna talk about the, uh, some language server hacks. I wanna talk about how these things, like how these things actually worked. I, I really like diving into internals, and I wanna show how I implemented these particular things and some of the caveats. One of the caveats that I kind of hinted at earlier is that in order for this to work, we actually have, you actually have to be running your dev server. So in order to get the, these types of features, your dev server has to be running. 
Now, if, we, if we're okay with running a dev server, then we can actually accomplish all of these tasks, and I, I kind of want to show how I did it, and the code is too, I'm sure it is too small, so I will tell you what it does. When we hover over, when we hover over something, the editor will tell us what position we're hovering over. It'll tell the language server what that is. And all we have to do in the language server is we go find that line and extract it, check to see if it's a constant, and we can say like, hey, is this constant, since this language server is running in the same process as our, root, our Rails server, we can go look up that constant, check to see like, hey, are you, are you a descendant of active record base? If so, I'm gonna go look up your columns, then I'm gonna turn those columns into, a, into markdown, and then feed them back into the editor, and the editor can display them. Same idea with URL helper information. When somebody hovers over something, we can check it and say like, hey, is this, is, is, does this start with the lowercase letter? Does it end with underscore path or underscore URL? If so, let's go look up the route helper, see if this actually exists. If it does, then we'll go look up, we'll go look up the path information because Rails knows the path that it would generate. So we can ask your, your app, like what path would this generate? So we, we put that into Markdown as well, generate the path also, Rails also knows the controller and action that that thing would route to, so we're able to bubble that up to the editor as well. Uh, jumping to definitions is a little bit harder. Uh, since we're generating all of these URL helpers, we have to keep track of where those, were, where those helpers were defined, and we weren't actually doing that before. We were not keeping track of where these helpers were defined. What I did was, I, I was actually talking to I was talking to John Hawthorne at GitHub and telling him about the, telling him about, John is also on the Rails core team as well. Uh, I was talking to him about this, this hack that I was doing and my ideas for my presentation here. And he said, well actually, um, we, we at GitHub want this feature because we have so many routes that we would really like it if you, like, when you do Rails, when you do Rails routes, it would show the, lo the definition location because there's, there's so many of them, we don't know where they are. Uh, and we've actually started working on this already, and he showed me the WIP PR, and I was like, yes, please, that is exactly what I want. So they finished up, they finished up the PR, I merged it in, and now in Rails 7.1, you should be able to do bin Rails routes dash E, and it'll show you what line each of those helpers was defined on, so you can go back into your routes file and find where a helper was defined. Now, since they, they kindly implemented that feature for me, I could just piggyback off of that and implement that inside of the, the uh, language server. We'll say, hey, let's just go look up, look up that route. We ask the route, what is your source location? Get the, get the file in the line, go find that file in line, calculate the, column for, calculate the column inside the file, just construct our response and send that, over to, send that back to the editor. So no problem there. Uh, the next thing I wanted to show off is getting error information, and this, so the, our, the previous feature required Rails modifications, this feature required Ruby and Rails modifications, and these modifications are like, uh, not obvious, I think is the way to put it. So ERB is converted into Ruby. When we write ERB files, those are compiled into Ruby scripts, we evaluate those Ruby scripts and then execute them. So a problem with this is that if we're converting this ERB into Ruby and some exception gets raised inside of that, that Ruby code, it doesn't really map back to the ERB template that we have. So we have to keep, like, how do we, how do we figure out, like, okay, well, you know, there is an exception raised here, like, where, how does, this, how does this map back to the actual line and column in the ERB file? It's kind of hard to calculate. So we had to figure out a way to do this. And I don't know if any of you have seen like um, when, you, when you run a Ruby script, you'll see like ASCII art of the, like there's an error, it'll show you ASCII art of the actual column, the column information. The way that that column information is calculated, um, Ruby actually reparses your script. So this is kind of like how, you probably don't want to know how the sausage is made in this case, because it's like basically a pile of hacks, but it totally works. What we do is we, re we reparse that script and we maintain, we maintain parse note or IDs for each, each AST node, then we go look up the AST node, give it an ID, and that ID is in the exception information. I know this is probably TMI, but you can go Google it later and check it out. What we had to do is, we had to figure out, given a particular stack frame, give me the node ID or the parse free node ID for that particular stack frame, and that, didn't, that type of feature did not exist. We had to find it for the ERB, so Eileen sent a pull request to Ruby to do this, so we can say like, for any stack frame, please give me the node ID associated with that. So we can go ahead and look up that ID, so this is one part of the puzzle. 
The next part of the puzzle is that error highlight, that thing that showed us the line and column information as ASCII art, it wants an exception. You would give it an exception and then the, it would take the exception, figure out the node ID and then give you the ASCII art to show you where that error was. Now we don't have that and we don't want to give that to error highlight because we have generated code. Instead, what we want to give it is we want to give it a node ID. We want to say, hey, I need you to go, like, here's a node ID and here's a blob of, here's an AST, please tell us the information. So Eileen sent another PR to error highlight where we could pass it a node and then from that we were able to get, get ERB information. This enabled me to send a pull request to Rails. Finally, we're like, yeah, we're completely unwinding the yak here, hopefully. So I was able to send a PR that would display, like, display column information in error messages. So if you have an error message in your ERB template, before this change it would look like this, where it's just showing you the line. After this change, it'll actually show you the line and the column in the error. Now I have to say, I have to give a really huge shout out and thank you to Mame. He is the one that implemented the first version of this that shows you the line and column information in normal Ruby scripts. We took what he did and ran with it and we were able to show that in ERB files as well. Now that we have the line and column information for ERB templates in, in Rails itself, we're able to extract that, pull it into a language server and then finally send it back to, oh, oh right. <laughs> So back into the details of how this is implemented. First thing we do, we put together a message, we push it onto an error queue. Then I had another thread that just sits there and pops off the error queue. Once it pops off the error queue, it sends that message back to the, back to the, the, um, uh, back to the editor and then we can bubble that information up. The point of all this is that this is a Rube Goldberg machine. <laughs> And I'm surprised that any of this works at all. <laughs> it feels like it's completely held together with duct, duct tape and string. Anyway, I, I, I kind of want to like finish this up, finish this presentation up with a pitch. I want to make a pitch, like kind of a pitch to you, the audience. I also want to make a pitch to the rest of the Rails core team as well. Uh, I think that we're currently in the middle of a revolution in terms of developer productivity with uh, new technologies that are going to be changing the, way that, changing the way that we work. Rails has been at the forefront of new technologies and also pushing, pushing that, that forward. And I think, it's, I think uh, adopting these types of things is very, very on brand for us. Uh, one thing that bothers me, really, really bothers me about language servers is that every language server out there today implements different features. I kind of mentioned that earlier when we were implementing our own language server. We have to, we say what features we have and what this means is like, if you want, so, for example, Solar Graph may implement some feature and Ruby LSP may implement some other feature. And that means that you have to sit there and like do this Venn diagram in your head of which language servers support which feature and then which ones do I need so that I can get the thing that I want. And this really, really bothers me. It means I have to go through this, this store and figure out like, okay, do I want the one with the highest, like the highest rating or the most votes or the most downloads? I don't know which thing that I need. And that really, really bothers me. I feel like I'm wasting my time. I don't know which one to choose. So my pitch is that Rails should include a language server by default. We've taken pride in increasing developer productivity by making choices for you. And I think that including a language server in Rails will not only increase the, our, our productivity, but also save time for us because we don't need to decide. We don't need to decide this thing anymore. We just have it. And in addition, there should be, there should be only one. We should choose this one and all work on this particular one and make it better for everybody. In conclusion here, uh, I might not value my time, but I do highly value your time. <laughs> so I think we should focus on that. Thank you so much for coming and seeing me speak here today. I hope I was able to teach you something. I was so honored to be here. Uh, I hope I increased your creativity, but not too much. <laughs> Thank you all. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and smash that, smash that bell. <laughs>